Welcome to Real Talk, History as a Weapon for Black Liberation with Sundiata Chajua. My guest today is Bill Fletcher. Bill Fletcher is a labor organizer, novelist, black liberation activist, and uh, generally a scholar activist. Let me bring in uh, Mr. Fletcher. Greetings, Bill. How are Greetings, you doing? Sir, I'm great. I'm, I'm really glad to be doing this. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to have you. Uh, Bill is the author of several books, and I, I kind of want to highlight uh, a book that he did on uh, solidarity amongst workers. Mm -hmm. And the title is escaping me, so I apologize for, for that, but it's something about building solidarity, workers solidarity divided. divided. Solidarity divided. Right. And um, he's also published a novel and is working on a, a sequel. And the novel is entitled The Man Who Fell From the Sky. And we'll have some time to, to talk about the novel and its uh, coming iteration. Mm -hmm. So but so let me uh, start, Bill. The way I try and um, interview guests is to get some sense of who you are, or more importantly, how you came to be who you are, right? Because mm -hmm. it's the question of how we reflect on our experiences that determine who we become. So what I kind of want to know is when and where were you born? Where did you spend your formative years? And how did your class background place where you grew up, as well as the time period, the era in which you were born impact your future activism? Mm. I know it's, 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 it's a lot. Yeah, no, it, it's, so I was born in 1954 in New York. Um, I identify as a New Yorker, even though I live now in Maryland, uh, but my identity is very much a, that of a New Yorker. And I grew up in Manhatt Manhattan, the Bronx, and then a suburb of the New York called Mount Vernon, which is where Denzel Washington lived, by the way. He and I came within about six months of meeting each other. Um, I, I came up in a family that was very progressive um, and liked to discuss world events. And I think that that had an incredible impact on me. My great-grandfather on my mother's side, one of my great-grandfathers, was a very, very famous pre-Harlem Renaissance uh, writer, poet, anthologist, um, named William Stanley Braithwaite. And I had the opportunity of knowing him for the first eight years of my life. This was a really interesting person who was very influential over many of the major figures of the Harlem Renaissance and was uh, very close friends with W.B. Du Bois. Um, in fact, Du Bois lived across the hall from him uh, for a while in 409 Edgecombe Avenue in Manhattan. Um, and it turned out my great-grandfather was part of the founding of the Crisis Magazine, which I didn't realize. And, and um, th there's a whole story there, Sundiata. Um, but we, we would talk in my family about politics, about struggle. And when I was young in the Bronx, uh, in the 60s, there was a lot of struggle going on. The Black Freedom Movement was raging on. Other movements were rising. And I started reading Muhammad Speaks. And I was a kid, you know, uh, the, I was reading the paper, The Nation of Islam. And I didn't really, I didn't go for the theological stuff at all. But The Nation of Islam uh, in Muhammad Speaks covered world events. And so I read that and just ate it up. What, what age are you? Under 13. Uh, because in the fall of 67, when I was 13, I happened to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. My parents had bought it, uh, bought a paperback version of it, and I read it, and I couldn't stop reading it. And I tell people all the time, Sundiata, that after I finished that book, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. 
I mean, it really did change my life. And I, I realized at that point that I needed to be a social justice activist and the cause of black liberation, uh, the cause of liberation of the oppressed. And it was, it was a remarkable transformation for me. Then I became influenced by the Black Panther Party, which I felt was the uh, real inheritor of Malcolm X's legacy. Uh, and uh, from there, started to learn about socialism and Marxism, uh, became very active in high school radicalism, uh, went to college with the intention of becoming a lawyer, um, but remained very active while I was an undergrad and lost interest in going on to law school, but developed an interest in the labor movement. Uh, and I was very influenced by Ewart Gunier, the father of Lonnie Gunier. Ewart Gunier was the chairman of Afro-American studies at Harvard. And he was uh, a leftist, um, probably a former communist, had been at one point the highest ranking, one of the highest ranking African-Americans in the labor movement in the 1940s, very influential and turned out, ironically, to have been very a very close family friend. I'd never realized that. Um, and But Gunier and others helped to inspire me to, to get into the labor movement. And I was part of a whole set of leftists that decided to either leave college or after graduating from college to go to work in workplaces uh, and, and to organize, organize workers. And I saw that as a particular means of organizing black workers. Uh, so I did that. And, you know, one thing you and I were sort of talking about before is that when I went to college, like many other people, you know, when you're in your teens, late teens, I, I was, I was, um, trying to reinvent myself in some ways. And, um, you know, I went to college and, and people knew me as Bill Fletcher. But when I got to college, I decided to change my name. Not officially, but I changed it. And uh, ultimately it was Ahmed Malik Kasim. Kasim spelled either K-A-S-S-E-M or Q-A-S-S-E-M. And it's a name that means, uh, Kasim means to divide justly. And it had been the name of the leader of the Iraqi revolution in 1958. And I took the name for a variety of reasons. And, and then people started calling me Q. And many people that uh, I went to college with still do call me Q. Well, when I got out of college, I was going to work in workplaces to organize. Some were non-union, some were unionized. But I was going in as a leftist to do organizing work. And it was very clear to me that there was not going to be anyone that was going to hire Ackerman Malik Kassim. Uh, and, and so I went back to Bill Fletcher and have been Bill Fletcher ever since. Can't hear you. That's, that's quite an amazing story and interesting background and I find that whenever I talk to people in our age range, mm -hmm. that um, there's a similar story. Mm -hmm. The autobiography of Malcolm X features heavily in it. Um, the Black Panther Party mm -hmm. as a uh, model, whether they joined or not, but it, 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 it represents a frame uh, so that you get study and you get activism. Um, but it seems to be the similar group of individuals and organizations that influenced uh, that, that generation. So I want to, I want to kind of build on the conversation mm -hmm. and, and ask you, you know, you've been, as you just described, uh, for almost all of your adult life, you, well, for, mo for all your adult life, you've been associated with uh, and played a leadership role in worker, socialist, Marxist oriented segment of the black liberation movement, mm -hmm. what is euphemistically called the black left. Right. right. And mm -hmm. so can you talk about your understanding of the black left and talk about it in the context of 
uh, the divergences and the convergences with other streams in the Black liberation movement. So for example, the liberal stream and different species of Black nationalist uh, perspectives and actions. Wow, okay. So I became, when I, when I, when I use the term left, I mean people that are anti-capitalist. They may not have a clear ideology, but they're anti-capitalist. I don't mean left as in Obama is to the left of Mitch McConnell or something like that. Um, but I mean uh, an identifiable left. One of the conclusions, Sundiata, I came to after reading the autobiography of Malcolm X is that capitalism was antithetical to black liberation. And even though I don't think it would be fair to describe Malcolm as having been a socialist, he was certainly pro-socialist. And he had a, a deep critique of capitalism. And so coming out of reading the autobiography, I, I, I started to feel like there was really something fundamentally wrong with the system. It wasn't just about racism and discrimination. It was something much deeper which the Panthers started filling in the blanks for me. Um, I mean, there were other groups that contributed, but particularly the Panthers started filling in the blanks and, and helping me to look at capitalism as a system and, and, and not looking primarily at whether it was white people or black people or something else. Um, this was a, a dramatically different approach than those that identified the problem that we face as a problem of white people or a problem uh, as the liberals would define it in terms of just a discrimination. The left point of view, uh, particularly that of Marxist, was that there was something systemically going on that uh, was, was at the heart of the oppression of those of us of African descent. And more than that, and this was something I also appreciated from the Panthers, was that it wasn't us alone. Um, now, at, at one point, I considered myself a revolutionary nationalist when I was close to the Panther Party. But to me, what that meant was that I was focused primarily on African-Americans, but never exclusively. And I didn't look at all white people as being the enemy. I looked at the system of white supremacist capitalism as being the enemy. So... Um, but over time, the nationalist identity for me didn't work, um, and, and for a number of reasons. One is that we are in a country where, as African Americans, we are maybe 13 to 15 percent of the total population. So at a very basic level, we can't pull this off by ourselves. This is not Zimbabwe, South Africa, or Algeria. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. So to me, that posed immediately a strategic question. Um, and, and the other part uh, that I thought about and continue to think about is that even though I believe that African Americans have a right to self-determination, our situation is very different than classic colonies. In other words, the U.S. actually could let Puerto Rico go independent, and it wouldn't fundamentally undermine U.S. capitalism. Going no, 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 Bill, let, let, let me get some uh, further clarification here. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's the argument that capitalism and its relationship, it, it, its imperialist expression had, had moved from a stage of what some people call classical colonialism, even though there's a variety, there's indirect rule, there's direct rule, right? Uh, had moved toward what Kwame Nkrumah called neo-colonialism, mm -hmm. right? So is your argument that that transformation to neo-colonialism explains why the revolutionary nationalist interpretation did not work in terms of understanding capitalism? No. It didn't fit, or is there some other something deeper. line of thought? Okay, something it's, deeper. It's, it's that 
the oppression of African Americans and Native Americans is central. It's, it's the mortar that holds US capitalism together. Mm -hmm. So, so that whereas, and this is not to, by the way, not to downplay the oppression of other groups at all. I'm not into that whole hierarchy thing that people get into, but it is to say that at a structural level, the U.S. could, could uh, uh, grant independence to Puerto Rico and it wouldn't fundamentally change U.S. capitalism. The U.S. could actually grant independence to the Hawaiian Islands and it wouldn't fundamentally challenge U.S. capitalism. But it can't do that with us because our existence is essential to keeping U.S. capitalism together. The, the, the our and the Native Americans is at the root of the construction of the U.S. settler state and the, the othering of African Americans and Native Americans is really critical for the social control over all working people in the United States. And I felt that the revolutionary nationalist analysis didn't really account for that. And to, to too much, it was thinking about how do we liberate African Americans in the absence of raising this broader question of whether you can do that in the absence of taking on U.S. capitalism and in the absence of bringing together a broader alliance of forces in order to do that. And, and I'm not saying that all revolutionary nationalists ignore that, but for the most part, I didn't see the answer in classical revolutionary nationalism. So, uh, so over time, I, I saw myself as um, an internationalist who was a black liberationist. In other words, my focus has largely mm -hmm. been on the freedom of people of African descent. And, and I'm situated particularly among working class people. Uh, so I'm not like acting like um, I'm a citizen of the world or something like that. Okay. Right? But I am saying that in order to win here, we have to be constructing a strategy that creates an identity of the broader oppressed so that the broader oppressed see themselves as having a common interest um, in in taking on this system of, of white supremacist capitalism. And so over the years, I've focused a great deal on that, which um, has led to different projects, such as the one you and I met in uh, the Black Radical mm -hmm. Congress. Right? And, and the importance, in my mind, of always building a strong Black liberation movement, because my view is, has been that when black folks are in motion, everything shakes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it doesn't mean that other movements, again, are unimportant. But there is a way, because of our relationship to the construction of capitalism, that when we're shaking, so does the, so does the larger system. And, um, but we can't do it alone. And that's the thing that, that's one of the reasons that we've got to, we've got to realize that a few things. We've got to realize that we've got to build an army of the oppressed. But there's another thing we've got to be concerned about, which is that the that demographics alone are not going to liberate us. Right. So, Bill, I, I want to dig into something that, um, you know, there, there was an argument coming out of uh, the 60s and 70s, and in its simple iteration, it was black workers take the lead. Right. But what that slogan stood on was the understanding that within uh, industrial capital in the Fortis economy, black people occupy critical roles in steel, in rubber, in auto, in glass, right? In, in the manufacturing industry. And that we could shake the country because of our role as well as on the docks. Right. Um, capital has transformed out of its Fortis mm -hmm. formation into a global financialized racial capital. 
Mm -hmm. So the, the, the rich part is still there, but we no longer occupy the most important nodes of this 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 this, this, this aspect of capital accumulation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're not completely powerless. You know, we still got dock workers. We still postal truck drivers but we're no longer as central as we were. And we've also become uh, much more of a sub-proletariat than the most centrally located proletariat. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how those transformations, um, the argument that you're making, how do you account for the transformation from Fortis uh, industrial capital, even in a transnational form, right? to right. what is now global racial capital that's financialized and we've been reduced to a sub-proletariat broadly. Yeah, so this and, is- And in not industrial industries, right? Well, yes and no. Um, so what I wanna do first is go back to the slogan. Yeah. Because the slogan had a few different meanings. One that you identified, but another was an assertion of the need for black working class leadership of the black freedom movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I want to say something about that before turning to your critical question. Um, what, when we look at the history of the black freedom movement, around the time that King was killed in 68, the Black Freedom Movement plateaued strategically. Um, it had succeeded in, in, in many very important ways in winning uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act, both of which were of great significance. Um, there were uh, many very important court decisions and other things that were going on. But what King started to realize in 66 was that it was simply not enough and that something <clears throat> needed to happen. And when you look at King's last two years, it, it speaks to this quandary that was facing the Black Freedom Movement of, uh, of what's, the, what's the next mountain to climb? And King answered that very clearly by identifying economic justice and what we would call now global justice. Um, but the movement was divided on this, uh, uh, Sundiyad, as you know. And, and there were those that basically said, no, we've won. And, and that element within our community that was represented by uh, what you could call the kind of professional managerial element, the small business owners, and some not so small business owners saw the victories of the 60s as the end, not the beginning, not a middle stage, but the end. And that, uh, that what needed to be done was to protect those victories, but really not going much further. The only exception being what ultimately happened around the African, the European colonies in Africa. So black workers take the lead was among other things saying that there needed to be a different kind of class leadership mm -hmm. of the black freedom movement to push the black freedom movement, I would argue, more along the lines of what Dr. King was talking about and fundamentally about what Malcolm was talking about, as opposed to remaining on the plateau and going in the direction that someone like Bob Johnson would have advocated the founder mm -hmm. of the ET. So I, I think that we have been in that battle ever since, and that there's been different parts of that battle. The, uh, the Black-led electoral upsurges that began in the late uh, 1970s and went into the 80s was an attempt to get off of the plateau. And I think that the Jesse Jackson campaigns of 84, and particularly 88, were real attempts to move us and to have us at the central uh, part of a transformational movement. So I want I, I think that that's a critical thing to add into this. Now, directly to your question, 
Um, so what, what happened in the beginning in the late 60s is that global capitalism itself started to transform. And it was in large part a response to a particular kind of crisis within mm -hmm. Keynesian economics. And, and, and the capitalists felt that they weren't getting the kind of profits that they wanted. It wasn't that they weren't getting profits, but they weren't getting them at the rate that they had been getting them in the 50s and early 60s. And it's and, in, and, and they're being challenged by uh, there's a lot of wildcat strikes. That, that's as well right. As the Black Liberation Movement, so that's they're, right. re they're responding to uh, to struggle. They respond, which is critical, Sundiata. It's 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 uh, uh, responding to various struggles. One, the greater entrance of women into the workforce and the impact, right? Um, the the African American struggle, um, the struggle of workers against speedums mm -hmm. and yeah. against terrible conditions. And so you're right. So part of what was going on was that the popular movements were putting demands on capital for a greater share of the social surplus. Mm -hmm. And capital didn't want to give that up. So they started embarking on a search for a different form of accumulation, a different mm -hmm. process. And they stumble into what has come to be called neoliberal economics or what I call capitalist fundamentalism. And, and with the idea mm -hmm. of remove all the obstacles to the accumulation of profits. And that means targeting the social safety net, but it meant more than that. It meant also weakening and destroying worker organizations mm -hmm. and related to your point, relocating industry away from key areas that had been unionized and where there had been large numbers of people of color. So what was called deindustrialization is actually a misnomer. Yeah. It was the relocation of industry. It wasn't that the U.S. lost its industrial base. It was that a combination of new technology and the relocation of industry out of, in many cases, major cities and right. putting... Uh, like steel mills in the woods, right? And that had a devastating impact on the working class as a whole, but particularly the working class of color, African Americans, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans. And, so, and you know, you you can uh, add to this. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you talked about the, their effort to gain a larger share of the social safety net. That social there's surplus. a so, social surplus, but in, in terms of the social uh, safety net, there's a real move to like what the civil rights movement did was to locate a very significant sector of black workers within the state as That's public right. workers, right? right? So for example, uh, black lawyers, 50% of black lawyers employed by the state, mm -hmm. whether it's the federal or the regional state or local government, right? Mm -hmm. Only 25% of white uh, attorneys. Mm -hmm. And you get that across all of the professions so that black people come to represent a disproportionate sector of public employees. That's and right. this partly is gonna explain Reagan's moves, That's right? right? But That's the right. point is that it's an attack on industrial capital, but it's also an, an attack on these, as, as black people moved into that uh, professional managerial class, I call them just neo-colonialists. Mm -hmm. But uh, as they moved into that, this is an attack on them because they play a significant role within the public sphere in yes. that way. Yes. That's right. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that is implicit in what you're saying is that when neoliberal capital begins its offensive, and particularly under Reagan, it starts coming after the public sector because the public sector, uh, or elements of the public sector, are sources of profits that various capitalists identify that they uh, they could utilize. So the question, though, for them is how do they privatize? And there was an ideological assault on the public sector that included racializing the public sector. You know, there's an old saying, those who the gods will destroy, they first made mad. And I took that saying and, and redid it and said, those who the gods will destroy, they first colorize, right? So 
in order to attack the public sector, what the right wing understood is you color it, right? You basically make the public sector black and brown, African-American and Latino, Latina, and claim that whites don't benefit from it and it becomes easier to attack and destroy it because whites will sit back and say, well, this doesn't involve us. And that is a lot of what we have seen over the last 40 years. Um, now, this other point that you're raising about the decline of the black manufacturing worker can't be denied, but it's in the context of the decline of the manufacturing worker in the United States as a whole, that, um, that as I mentioned before, with uh, changes in technology, with the relocation of industry, some outside of the United States, some inside of the United States, the workforce has changed. And what's also happened is that you have different demographics in some sectors. Like, for example, meatpacking, which is a very, very important industry in the Midwest. And for years was primarily a, literally, a black and white industry. That is, whites and African Americans. But when neoliberalism basically hits the meatpacking industry, what it does is that it shifts the nature of the industry and they start bringing in immigrant workers mm -hmm. and they start de-unionizing the workplaces that had been, uh, had been unionized and had great union, the packing house workers union. And they start bringing in non-union workers and particularly from Latin America. And it changed the workforce. Let, let, let me let me add here because meatpacking was always immigrant labor, but it was southeastern and southern Europeans. So right. you're talking about when they begin to bring in workers from Mexico, largely, right. and, and from right. yeah, yeah, largely exactly from right. Central and South America. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That's right. The meatpacking industry, African Americans, really get into the meatpacking industry around World War I. One, yes. And, and, uh, and play a major role, by the way, in organizing, um, uh, in the meatpacking industry, organizing unions. Mm -hmm. But then, right, later on, and you see that in several sect sectors, uh, meatpacking, the janitorial industry. The janitorial industry um, had been European immigrants and then increasingly African-Americans. But then what happens is the janitorial industry is reorganized so that the janitors no longer work for the building owners. The That's building right. owners subcontracted yeah. and they brought in these companies who would bring in non-union, yeah. immigrant, and often undocumented labor. And so the workforces that had been unionized all of a sudden vanished and almost overnight workforce, the janitorial workforce has changed, right? right. And, right. and unfortunately, because of the weakness of the left and the weakness of the trade union movement, those kind of changes sometimes got summarized in very ethnic ways so that African-Americans would blame not the owners, but they blamed the Latinos and yeah. so on and so forth. Well, you know, the other piece here is that this is also the moment in which uh, the earlier phase of this, Richard Nixon is uh, pushing his understanding of black power as black capitalism. That's right. So that in that shift to uh, have uh, private subcontractors within the janitorial as a means of breaking those unions, there's a number of black folk who start janitorial companies and are part of that process because at every moment there is an incorporation of uh, the black bourgeoisie that's right in, 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 into it so they, they they play a significant role oh brother you're absolutely right and that was called black power by some people that's right absolutely and, and particularly the right wing of our movement would identify that as black power um and mm -hmm. and some would go f even further and and suggest everything about um breaking unions, uh, encouraging more uh, non-union workplaces, the whole fixation with so-called enterprise zones mm -hmm. in our communities, 
all of that. Well, okay, that then takes us to this question you're raising um, about, well, what does this mean with the weakening of the black manufacturing worker? And, yeah. and I actually don't have a good answer for that because I think that the black working class still remains, uh, we, we are the most unionized of any ethnic group, yeah. believe it or not. Um, yeah. And we are the most pro-union. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the things that union organizers always identify, you go in a workplace, you look for the um, African-American workers and particularly the African-American women who are regularly the core of union organizing efforts. Um, but what this also means is that the strategic role that we might have had in certain industries has absolutely been diminished. There's, there's no question about that. But it is not non-existent. But it is definitely diminished. And, and it corresponds, as I was saying before, to the way that industry as a whole has shifted in the United States, which is something that Donald Trump was trying to play on in his uh, campaign for office and his presidency, that he was going to return the United States to the 1950s. And the changes in global capitalism that ain't going to happen. You, you're absolutely correct. That's not going to happen. But we, we do find ourselves uh, in a kind of conundrum. It's much easier. You know, I worked in a Firestone factory building tires for about six years of my life. So I took three semesters out to finish my BA. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in fact 3,000 workers. Mm -hmm. Organizing is a lot easier to do than in an economy where you got, what, 60 workers, um, three shifts at McDonald's. That's right. Um, you know, so we have to fact that in. But, Bill, we've got questions coming through, and I want to save them for the end. Okay. So we're going to go to uh, uh, 815. We're going to do the full 75-minute piece. With a guest like you, we gotta we got to extend the time, my brother. So, right. but I want to get to a couple of the other questions that I have, sure. and and one of them is um, two formations that you played major leadership roles in. One was Trans Africa, where you were the executive director, president. President. you president for for a very important period in Trans Africa, and then of course you were one of the uh, five people that called together the Black Radical Congress and you played a major role in leading and directing it and holding it together. And those are two formations. When I look back, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of our international activity and, and concern as a people, and we've always been internationalists, particularly Pan-Africanists. Um, not having Trans-Africa, mm -hmm. I think, uh, poses a serious problem in the, in the sense that while there were limitations, mm -hmm. um, you know, there'd been a struggle to push it further to the left, but it was, it, but it played an important role and we need something like that. The mm -hmm. other is the Black Radical Congress, which you said, that's where you and I met. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to see a formation develop something uh, as pithy yes. as the Black Freedom agenda. Mm -hmm. And I th and I think the way in which we brought together different streams of the black left, many things that you see emerging to today, like the gender equality that was built into the foundation of the Black Radical Congress, the incorporation of the LGBTQ movement into the Black Radical Congress, that these are things in addition to our position on workers and reparations mm -hmm. that we can you know, hang our hat on. And so my, my question is, what would you, can you begin to talk about uh, the importance of those two formations and the contributions, the legacies 
that they leave for the current generation of scholar activists? Sure. So before I do that, let me just wrap up the very last point that we were talking about with a suggestion that the strategic centrality of black workers may not primarily be in the workplace uh, in the way that it once was. Okay, you, you got to elaborate. Okay, so part of what you had been raising before was about the importance that black workers had in the workplace, in strategic industry, and, and you know, like steel, auto, et cetera. And, and I'm suggesting that our importance might, that looking at our importance vis-a-vis -vis industry may be too narrow, it's not a criticism, maybe mm -hmm. too narrow a way of looking at it that our importance and the importance of the black worker may be as a radical catalytic force within a larger labor movement. Labor being defined much more mm -hmm. broadly in terms of the struggle of workers, some of which takes place in communities, some of which is among the unemployed, some of which is in workplaces, but it necessitates new forms of organization some of which are experimented with now and some of which have not. Now, we could go into a lot more detail on it, but I didn't want to leave your audience just hanging. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did that because, again, this is a, the subtitle is History as a Weapon for Black Liberation. So the, the, ref, the point that you just made, right, uh, I see it as building on the argument that Lenin made about nationalities being a catalytic force. And, of course, C.L.R. James, makes that central to his whole over where he talks about, uh, particularly uh, he's talking about African-Americans, uh, mm -hmm. right? Specifically in the role that we have played in, in U.S. history, that there have been those moments where we galvanized the, the, the push in terms of democracy. And, and so, so, yeah, I think that's an extraordinarily yeah. important point that you're making. So I just wanted to yeah. emphasize that because I don't want anyone to, it goes back full circle to the centrality of the African-American, Native American in the construction and, and, and sustaining of capitalism cannot be overstated. When we shake, the foundation rocks. Um, now to your question about Trans-Africa and, and Black Radical Congress, which I really appreciate your asking. So I was the second president of Trans Africa, and um, and it's interesting, Sundiata, because Trans Africa experienced the same dilemma that the Black Freedom Movement experienced domestically, but we experienced it later. So. That was a strategic plateau. Mm -hmm. the, the, the framework that we, that African-Americans had been forced to look at international affairs, particularly after World War II, was very much a, a racial analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and anytime someone would raise issues of class and other things, they'd be red baited. So there was a, there were very much of a racial framework. And and to some extent, that fit in with a lot of the struggles, the anti-colonial struggles and the anti-white minority rule struggles. So mm -hmm. there were broad fronts that could be developed in the United States um, against white minority rule, against Portuguese colonialism, Spanish sure. colonialism, et cetera. So you're okay. talking about like the, the African Liberation Support Committee. Exactly. And, okay. exactly. And, and so the Trans-Africa emerges as um, an extension of the Congressional Black Caucus in foreign affairs, and then becomes an independent organization. And its focus is on Southern Africa. Now, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, the fight for freedom in South Africa and against apartheid. Mm -hmm. When apartheid, uh, when, when Mandela is liberated, and when and apartheid starts to crumble, 
This created a very interesting challenge for Trans Africa because its raison d'etre had been basically the freedom of people of the African world from colonialism and white minority rule. Okay, and and so a couple things happened. One was that the African National Congress, which was soon to take power in South Africa, did something that I saw the Eritrean People's Liberation Front do, and I saw mm. Sinn Féin do in, in Ireland, which was to break off its contacts with its U.S. allies, particularly those on the left, because they wanted to start to uh, work new mm. arrangements with U.S. Uh, capital. And, and so all of a sudden, Trans-Africa was sort of cut loose. But more importantly, the, the strategic situation had changed because Soviet Union. <laughs> Soviet Union was gone. China was going a different road. And, right. and apartheid was over. And, and one way to dramatize the problem is that in 1994, the same year that South Africa becomes liberated, is the year of the Rwanda genocide. Damn. And Black America was thrilled by South Africa's liberation and was almost totally silent about the Rwanda genocide. Notable exceptions yeah. being Randall Robinson, right? And part mm -hmm. of that was that the Rwanda genocide did not make any sense, right? right. It didn't correspond to a, 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 a racial analysis in, in the traditional way, right? And and what would what was you know I used to, used to say that if a hundred Belgian paratroopers had landed in Kigali and killed a thousand Rwandans, we would have burned everything Belgian down, right? But <laughs> close to a million Rwandan Tutsis and the Hutu allies mm -hmm. are killed in ninety days, yeah, and most of us said nothing, right? So when so this became a problem for Trans Africa in the sense of well what do we do, what's our purpose because it's a different situation, and when I took over Trans Africa it was a shell of itself, and we were trying to reorient, but the truth be told, Cindy, is that there were too many people that were trapped in nostalgia. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, I had board members of mine who said, Bill, you got to find us a sexy issue. I said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean a sexy issue? I said, you know, an, an issue that would get us more involved. I said, yeah, like what? And they said, well, like South African apartheid. I said, you understand, of course, that it took 40 years, 40 years to build the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and the United States. Mm -hmm. It didn't just happen because Randall Robinson led a sit-in in 1983, right? And so there's this sort of delusional thinking that people had. And, and, and it, it really reflected that we had narrowed our parameters in terms of looking at the world and didn't understand the contradictions around gender, around class, mm -hmm. around the environment, around ethnicity, had risen in importance and could not be answered by a 1965 racial analysis of the world. And um, so I, I attempted to reorient the organization we, we led a historic delegation of Venezuela, first African-American delegation, to meet with Hugo Chavez, the then president. Um, and we started expanding our work. But despite that, there was pushback and there was this, this nostalgia mm -hmm. for looking for something that would unite us all when the reality is that the circumstances that led to broad unity around South Africa had vanished. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the Black Radical Congress was a, was a different situation, um, but I agree with you. Um, I, would, I would say that there would have been no Black Lives Matter without the Black Radical Congress, without the work that we did. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that to, you know, beat us on the chest, right? But I'm just talking about just like there would have been no Black Radical Congress 
had there not been the Black Panther Party, right. the Republic right. of New Africa, et cetera, right? right? That right. we stood right. on the shoulders of people. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. there are people out there in the movement today that think that they just pull this stuff out of thin air. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and we, we made some remarkable achievements and for a not insignificant amount of time brought together very diverse tendencies within the Black freedom movement, tendencies that in some cases have been almost at war with one another. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest with you, um, you played a major role in helping to contain the battles inside the, the, the BRC. But can you speak to those aspects of the legacy that people should pick up as threads? You know, my argument has always been that you have to move from the high point of struggle, of the last struggle. Yeah. You don't go down the mountainside. You go from the high point of the last struggle, the cutting edge. Right. And I'm not sure that that's what's happening. But can no. you speak to what the cutting edge those things that the BRC bequeath to uh, future generations? Well, there's a few important lessons that I would, I would point out. And one is uh, something I'm very, very concerned about. Um, my political training when I was a teenager, influenced by the Black Panther Party, was that you opposed what was called a no struggle attitude. In other words, yeah that when there were differences, you struggled them out. You didn't walk away, you know, right. you fought them out. And right. that fighting them out didn't mean pulling a gun on somebody. It meant struggling things out. And over the last 25 years, I've noticed a very different tendency that has developed ultimately into what people now call ghosting. Mm -hmm. Where- Cancel culture. Know, right, exactly. When there is a problem, you vanish. You cut people off. You don't struggle something out. You just boom. And I think that one of the things that we did uh, in the BRC is that we did struggle things through. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, unfortunately, did leave. Yeah. At, and, and that was, uh, and for some folks, I'll never forgive them. Um, but I think that overall, there was a tendency to try to struggle things through and to recognize that we were not each other's enemies. Um, another thing that I think was very important is that it's easy to form an organization and it's easy to dissolve an organization. It's hard as hell to sustain one. Yeah. And that and, and that sustaining an organization necessitates resources. Um, it necessitates commitment too, so that you have mm -hmm. to have a balance between volunteerism and staff. And, and so this tendency that we've seen, you and I have both seen this, of people saying, in effect, I'm not doing anything unless I get paid, yeah. is a complete disaster. You're not going to get paid to carry out a revolution. It just doesn't work that way. Right? <laughs> and, and, and so you've got to understand that you need volunteerism of people rolling up their sleeves, right? Mm -hmm. But you also do need staff. You do need right. people that are going to... Their job is to focus, right? Um, uh, uh, another thing that I think that was, uh, was critical is that it, you've got to, as an organization, and I don't think that we resolve this, as an organization, you've got to figure out where can you best add value. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that means is that unless you're an organization of a million people, and even then, you can't do everything. And you've got to make some hard decisions about priorities. And this is something, this is a lesson I think to learn, even though I don't think that we did it right. I think by negative example, one of the things you learn is that priorities are not about putting things in order of importance. Prioritization is identifying what you're not going to do. And one of the problems in the BRC was our unwillingness, myself included, yeah. to say at certain points, you know what? You're, it's important. What you're talking about is really important. We're not going to be able to do it because 
What, because this is a moment, and this is where the issues of strategy come in, where you say, wow, this is a moment where we can actually add value if we jump in right now, which is what the National mm -hmm. Negro Congress understood in the mid-1930s, mm -hmm. when they understood that a Spirit. rising labor movement right. created an amazing possibility for Black workers, and they dived in, right? right. We in the BRC, right. um, we, we didn't do that. Uh, but we laid the foundation for things like we were talking about education, not incarceration. We were yeah. challenging the carceral state, right? We were right. talking right. about issues of economic justice. After 9-11, as you remember, we were talking about what some people came to call the national security state mm -hmm. and the issue of repression. So I feel like we were, as they used to say in that commercial, slightly ahead of our time. Yeah, you know, in in terms of raising the issues that needed to be raised, but it became very hard to sustain the organization, and unfortunately, there were differences that emerged that some people elevated to the level of irreconcilable, and 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 that was a shame. But we lasted for ten years. That is that is true, and I have to, in all honesty, accept some of that blame in terms of those errors. Uh, yeah, well, all of Absolutely. us. I appreciate that, bro. Yeah. And I would say all of us. There were mistakes. There was a mistake that I made, Sundiata, um, which I tell people about, um, which revolved around. Um, a statement condemning Robert Mugabe, the then president. Oh, of the I, I, I remember that battle. Remember that, right? Yeah, and, and, and so for your listeners, um, basically what happened was Robert Mugabe's administration was carrying out very vicious repression against opposition, and including people I personally knew in Zimbabwe who were arrested and tortured. And there was a... Um, a letter that was sent mm -hmm. around to different organizations to sign. And um, so I was on the coordinating committee. I went to the coordinating committee and the coordinating committee unanimously said, oh yeah, we, we need to sign it. And the mistake that I made, I take responsibility for this. The mistake I made was not appreciating the fact that within the BRC, even if the coordinating committee unanimously back this. And even if technically the coordinating committee had the right to sign this, politically, there were big differences within the BRC yeah. about, about how people looked at Mugabe, about whether to sign something. And instead of taking the temperature of the organization, which I, as the national organizer at the time, should have done, I just said, well, we've got the backing of the coordinating committee. Let's go forward. And that was a very big mistake. And I take responsibility for it. And, and there were some people that were so angry that they left the organization. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, and, 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 and so we made mistakes. We are human. Question is whether we learn from them. And, and I think uh, this is one of the reasons, Sumiata, I've really been encouraging somebody to write a book about yes. the BRC. Um, Absolutely. You know, and and like Jamal Rogers and I wrote uh, a 16 Bill, lessons piece. Bill, I was just gonna bring up the uh, issue of the black scholar. Yes. But, but yes. as an editor, I condensed your 16 lessons to nine. And that article, no one said that it would be easy, nine lessons learned from the right. building of the Black Radical Congress, which was uh, the spring 2014 issue of the Black Scholar. Very important issue that focused on uh, organizing it and did. struggle. And you it did was the last, job, last, right? last such issue coming out of that uh, previously hallowed venue. Oh, well, you did a hell of a job with editing. I must I must commend you. And, um, and, 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 you know, people have said to me, many people have said to me, Bill, why don't you write a book about the BRC? Yeah. I said, no, no, 
because see, I'm too close to it. Yeah, yeah. I really yeah. am. I and and I've I've encouraged, and and maybe maybe there are some of your students, Sundiata, or some other people in academia that are have a little bit more distance, because what I don't want, I don't want to write something that comes across as Bill Settling scores. <laughs> You, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I absolutely understand. But you know, I, it's interesting. Other than you and Jamala writing that piece, yeah, the only other pieces that any of us wrote were in the context of the movement itself. None of us have written reflective pieces, and and I agree with you that it, it that that story's got to be told. Now, there's two young guys that you may have be, been working with that have been going around doing interviews with folk. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You know, I think that's a good way to jumpstart the project. Yes. We, we need several books on the BRC experience. We really do. Honest. Yeah, there's a there's a, a, a young a, a, a young brother and sister uh, that are that are doing that, and we do. And 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 here's one of the things: the urgency of this. Uh, in the 1980s, when I was doing some research for what came to be a pictorial booklet called The Indispensable Ally, Black Workers in the Formation of the CIO. I interviewed several people who had been veterans of the 1930s and 40s, including uh, Harry Bridges, a white guy who had been the founder, yeah, yeah. Uh, founder leader of the West Coast Dock Workers. But I interviewed um, you know, Black folks who had been active, and many of whom, it's a funny story, man. I mean, they were very, many of them were very bitter because Ooh. of how they got treated as they got older, often feeling dispensed with by younger yeah. people or having their stories literally ripped off, right? So I wrote this, and these guys loved it, man. Yeah. And they were just, oh, my God, and I had pictures in it, and they just loved it. So it came out in 1987. In the early 90s, these guys were gone, you know? Mm. And, and it was like mm. the opportunity to get to them, it, yeah. it's like they were gone. And, and so I really would, would encourage people that might be interested, you know, this is the time to interview mm. people. That's right. Absolutely. Bill, um, I had a couple more questions, but... I've got questions coming through from the chat. Yes. And so I want to go through and pick up some of uh, those questions. Uh, sure. Okay. I'll start with a quick one. This is from um, Sharice Burden Stelly. We know her as Dr. CBS. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, one love of my her, favorite love writers. Her. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Rising star. Well, actually, I, she's no longer right. She's she's just a, a big light in the firmament, right. right? An amazing so person. She, she asked, what position did Trans Africa take on Rwanda? Mm -hmm. It took... Um, it oh, wait, was, there's a subtitle here, yeah. sub thing, because the Congressional Black Caucus dropped the ball massively. Right. So Randall Robinson spoke out against the Hutus, against the Hutu-led massacre, that was taking place of the Tutsis and uh, their allies. Um, and I believe called for United Nations intervention. I don't remember exactly, but I do know he spoke out and that basically there was silence throughout most of the rest of black America. And what's worse is that as the years have gone by, there has risen something that's called genocide denial that there are people that, uh, including some people that have been friends of mine, that have mm -hmm. argued that there really was no genocide, uh, that there was just simply a war and a lot of people got killed. Uh, and it, it's like, it's frightening. Yeah, yeah, it is. Now, we got another question from Emily M. Mm -hmm. uh, she always asks good questions, and so she's asking you, do you think there was a failure on the black activist community revolutionaries in understanding the importance of Bernie Sanders candidacy? 
That is an interesting question. Um, I, I I would frame it this way. In both 2016 and 2020, um, there were many Black left activists that sought to, and not just Black left, uh, but other leftists of color that tried to get involved in the Bernie Sanders campaign and were brushed off, myself included. Mm. Mm. And, um, and inexplicably. Um, and so in your question, Emily, I would say that many people underestimated the impact that Sanders had in reshaping the discussion. But what Sanders underestimated was the importance of basing himself, <clears throat> particularly in communities of color. I don't mean exclusively, but particularly. Right, right. And, and, <clears throat> and when I would hear people say, well, you know, people just need to get to know Sanders. I said, no, no, no. Sanders <laughs> needs to get to know people. Yeah, right? he needs yeah, to get to know us. Absolutely, right? he needs to be going to the Indian reservations and sitting down with them. He needs to be going into the barrios and talking with Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Chicanos. He needs to be sitting in our communities talking with us, uh, African Americans. And I didn't feel that that was happening in 2016. In 2020, there were improvements. Right. But um, what I think is at base is that, and I say this as somebody who voted for Bernie both times and consider myself a supporter, but I think that Bernie doesn't quite get race. He oh, understands. Oh, I think that's an understatement, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, he understands the dangers inherent in racism. But he doesn't appreciate the centrality of race in capitalism. Right. So he tends to look at capitalism, and this is a problem that a lot of white leftists have, um, and not just white leftists. Well, but it's, it's, just a, it's a Eugene Debs problem. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, that they look at capitalism as a sort of self-contained module Mm -hmm. And that racism is this other module Adjoin. that sort of can get connected to capitalism, That's but can right. get disconnected, right? right. And right. as opposed to understanding the, uh, the metaphor of the mortar, the mortar mm. as in yes. the wall, right? And and I think that's where Sanders missed it. And um, I wish that I wish that uh, uh, several of us had been able to be more influential. You know, um, generally I just try and be quiet during these periods, but there's a story that uh, John Bracey told me mm -hmm. about Bernie Sanders. Uh, John and Sanders were in Chicago core. Mm -hmm. And when Chicago core decided that it should have black leadership, Bernie, broke away and started an all white chapter of Chicago Corps. Mm -hmm. And I think that his failure to grapple with black power was symptomatic of his failure to understand the centrality of the black working class and the centrality of black people in any social movement in this society that's going to be transformative. Right. And that he never reconciled himself with that understanding and so, as you say, the, the, the question should have been, why hasn't Bernie built these these contacts? Yeah. Because had he built those contacts after 2016, when we get to 2020, a criminal like James Clyburn would not have been able to give the, 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 the election over to well, uh, Biden. I, I think that that's right. I, I, I'll, I'll reserve uh, a criti the criticism of Clyburn, but I understand your point. Um, I, I I felt very strongly that after 2016, that Sanders needed to deploy people 
immediately into the South. Mm -hmm. And and even though he did visit South Carolina, et cetera, um, the thing to understand about black folks is that we are simply not stupid, right? And and we are um, we're going to not just go for someone's language. We want to know what are you going to deliver, mm -hmm. and also what is your chance of winning? Yeah. And, yeah, and what have you done before? Right. What exactly. Have you done before. That's yeah. right. And, and people needed to be convinced. Now, I think in 2020, he was absolutely stronger and better than yeah. in 2016. Absolutely. Hands down. Absolutely. But I think he could have been even better. And I think that there's lessons to be learned there. That's all. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I would vote for him a third time. Yeah. Uh, Bill, we we're down to about four minutes. And I want to, to kind of switch up because you've done something that... Uh, I think is extraordinary in that your whole career has been as a hardcore reality, nonfiction scholar, activist, leading movements. And then you came up with a novel. Yes. Right. And usually the creative type and the, and, and the social science type don't come together. So tell us something about the, the novel and particularly the sequel. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate your asking. So the novel, as you had said, is The Man Who Fell From the Sky. Uh, it takes place in 1970, mainly in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And it's about race, justice, revenge, and Cape Verdean Americans. And, and most people in the United States actually don't know who the Cape Verdeans are. But the short story is they were the first post-1492 African people to come here voluntarily. And they came beginning in the 19th century from the Cape Verde uh, archipelago, 500 yes. miles off the coast of uh, West Africa. Um, this, let me tell you how I ended up writing this. So, you know, the thing is, Sundiata, I've always dreamed up stories. I just okay. haven't written them, right? Okay. And, um, and so back in around 2008, I wrote a, a manuscript for a murder mystery. And um, I had a lot of fun doing it. It was after I wrote Solidarity Divided, and I wanted to do a break. And and I'd been very inspired by Walter Mosley, who yeah. I had gotten to know. He was on the board of Trans Africa. I considered him a friend, and I loved his work, and particularly the Easy Rollins stories. And now, I, Barbara Neely also influenced you, right? Barbara Neely less so, although she oh. did. Because okay. Barbara and I, we were in Boston at the same time. Right, right. And um, and so um, so so the what I what I found in a number of different Mosley stories, the Easy Rollins, but others, was the way he dealt with politics, which I thought was really interesting, and dropping mm -hmm. in different things. So I right, wrote this right. manuscript in like 2008, and I really had fun writing it. And I went to an agent, and uh, which was, I was really surprised I was able to get to this agent. And she said she would read it. And a few weeks later, she got back to me and she didn't like it at all. And, and at her last words to me, which she uttered with a chuckle, were, when you go back to writing nonfiction, call me. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And, and I always tell people, if I hadn't enjoyed writing the manuscript, I would have been crushed. So, um, but I didn't go back to fiction immediately. So, but I, I, um, I was writing other things. But then I had this idea for a story. And so one day I was on vacation with my wife and daughter. And we were sitting by the beach and I told them this idea. And my daughter was looking at the floor and she said, dad, you have a story there and maybe even more than one story. You need to write it. Mm. And my wife said, yeah, she's right. And I wrote it. Um, and it's, it's a story that it, it goes back to an incident in World War II 
And it, it, uh, it, it, it is situated in 1970 in part because it's dealing with this transformation that's going on among Cape Verdeans at that time in terms of their consciousness. Mm -hmm. Are they white? Are they Portuguese? Are they black? What are they? And there are these fights that are going on, including within families. And so I use that to talk about race in a non-traditional way. And since we're basically out of time, let me just tell you, the sequel takes place. It starts in 1978, in the summer of 1978, in the Quincy Shipyard, which is where I used to work. Hmm. And it takes place a week after I fell 20 feet, um, which I did. I fell 20 feet. Hmm. And it, so it starts with a Cape Verdean immigrant welder who falls to his death, 15 feet. And it appears to be an accident. And that's where I'll leave it. Okay. Bill, I'm going to start reading it tonight. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, you've got me hooked. Thank you. Uh, let me thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and um, the engagement and just, uh, again, the wealth of knowledge and your contribution. So let me say, Asante Sana. Thank you, bro. I, and really, I, I've been looking forward to this ever since you approached me and uh, I loved it. And great questions. And thanks so much. And thanks for your friendship also. You, you're welcome. All right. So this has been uh, Real Talk history as a weapon for black liberation. Sundi Adichaju and my guest was Bill Fletcher Jr. And I wanna say thank you and we are out.